Thank you, Lord. I invite you at this time to turn into the New Testament to the Gospel according, not quite Luke, but it's the expounding of the Gospel in your life. It's in the book of Acts, and this is the author, Luke, continuing to tell the story of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and the church now, what it looks like to be a community of believers living together and living that out corporately. Now, we're in chapter 5, and things are starting to turn in this book, okay? So it's important for us to remember where we've been, because Luke has laid down a foundation that he expects us to remember as we move forward in this gospel. The series is the Acts of the Holy Spirit, so we're emphasizing the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, and how he continues the work of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the second person of the, the Trinity, and how they're both fulfilling God's um, really call on uh, his elect in this world and throughout all time, for that matter, for us even um, today. In chapter 1, verse 8, we saw that uh, Jesus called his disciples to be his witnesses in the world. And that's the overarching theme, that the disciples of Jesus were to image Christ we learned in Genesis that we were created in the image of God and the likeness of God. So that's our fundamental identity and design. We never depart from that. That's what we do as human beings and we're supposed to do is image and be in the likeness of God. And that's really what our salvation is all about. Salvation brings us back into the ability through the Holy Spirit to actually image Christ and image God. Well, once again, both verbally and visibly according to the scriptures. And so they laid down the foundation at the beginning of this church that is filled with the Holy Spirit. They were one in spirit. They were generous and compassionate and giving toward one another so that no one was without need. And they painted this beautiful picture of disciples who were focused on uh, the apostles' teaching, on the breaking of bread, on communion, on prayer, on gathering together. These fundamental things that we've talked about of what it means to be um, the church and the body. Well, things were all going well until last week, right? Um, when we encountered Ananias and Sapphira. And we uh, approached that in a particular way. It was very easy, as I mentioned last week, to have a very legalistic or licentious interpretation of this. This is why, from the very beginning, my very first message here was one about the gospel and how that's different than what I've called the pendulum of lostness. And some of you who are more visual people, I talk through this. If you need to see this, it's a little small. I know I apologize for that. You know, squint, do whatever you need to, to do. Turn around and look at that one. Maybe it's a little closer for you. Uh, this is it in a nutshell. It's a large nutshell, some of you are, are saying here. But if you look at the right, you see a red dot. That's the elder brother. He's lost. He's lost his moralism. He's lost in the sense that he thinks he's self-righteous and that he doesn't need God as a Savior, that his good works are going to save him and that the Father owes him an inheritance. He's lost. But that lostness is connected to the other side, the younger brother, which the emphasis is more on the younger brother there, the licentiousness of the younger brother. This is kind of the, the relativism, if, if you will, where they relativize the gospel and make it cheap grace. Right? They'll, they'll gladly accept, yeah, I, Jesus is my Lord, but I don't want him, excuse me, Jesus is my Savior. I will gladly accept that. I'll gladly accept that Jesus died on the cross for my sins so I go to heaven someday. All I have to do is just say a prayer, and that's all I have to do, and I get to go to heaven. They'll gladly accept that, but what they won't accept is Jesus is Lord, discipleship. It's grace without discipleship. Cheap grace is what we call it on that side. The younger brother is lost. The elder brother is lost. That's the whole point of that parable. That we're all lost apart from Christ. And that we all need Jesus. And that we all tend to fall back on this pendulum of, of lostness. We can respond to every situation either in three ways. A legalistic, law-driven way. Or a licentious, cheap grace kind of way. Or we can do it from a gospel kind of way. Which is a little bit harder because... You see those lines coming down. One's got kind of an X, a red X through it. What that's saying is the gospel rejects things on the right. Elder brother, moralism, 
self-righteousness. And it also rejects things on the left, this cheap grace, this licentiousness, that I don't need to follow Jesus in my life to be a disciple. I just need to believe that he died for my sins and I'm going to go to heaven some, someday. It rejects that categorically and other things as well. But it accepts things on both sides too. It embraces things on the right side. Hey, guess what? Law is important and obedience of faith is important. And we need to follow those things. So there's things on the right and the left that we need to be gracious for one another and create space for one another as well. So grace and law are both important in their proper context. That's what we did with Ananias and Sapphira. And this is what we're going to need to keep doing as we move through um, Acts. And for that matter, any, any passage is to see it through the gospel and not from a legalistic or a licentious kind of, kind of way. And as we move into um, the second part of five, we're going to see persecution continue to unfold in the church. And, and I want us to think about how the disciples respond to the difficulties and the struggles that they are facing. Because right? it seems in this country we're moving in a direction where there's going to be more problems for Christians and more difficulties and struggles. And we're going to have to learn how we engage that, not from a legalistic or a licentious kind of way, but from a gospel kind of way, which is a little bit more challenging to do. All right? So I invite you to keep that in mind. Um, I'm going to do this morning just a little bit differently than I have in the past. Um, I'm going to pray. And then we're going to read through the text. I'm going to kind of do some expository kind of stuff on the text as we go through it. So kind of the preaching is going to be as we read through the text. This text kind of lends itself that way. It's a storytelling. There's a lot of stuff that's going on here. And it's in some ways better to kind of just point that out as we're going through. And I'll bring that all to a conclusion um, in the end. That's okay with you. So let's pray at the end of this time. Heavenly Father, um, we thank you for this text we're about to read, um, a story of your disciples a long time ago, but that is very relevant for us today. May we learn from your word and from what they did and how they responded that we might be able to do so today um, as well in a way that honors and glorifies you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Right before we get into text, I just want to share a short story that will kind of serve as some focus to where we're going. Now, I think most of us, if, if you grew up in the United States anyways, and I think elsewhere, um, you play the game, follow the leader, right? We all know this game. It's a common game that we play as, as a youth. And this is actually in Ludington, Michigan, about an hour and a half um, northwest of Grand Rapids in Holland, Michigan of kids playing follow the leader. The traditional way to do it is someone is the leader and the rest, you gotta follow that leader wherever they go and do whatever they do. It's, you know, hopping on rocks, skipping off those, climbing into trees and out of trees, splashing through puddles. Whatever the leader wanted to do, you did. Somersaults, shooting baskets, you know, whatever it was that the leader saw and found that they wanted to do, that's what you ended up doing. And oftentimes they take on the character of the leader. You know, if the leader liked basketball, you are pretty sure they'd pick up a basketball and include basketball in following the leader. If they were into gymnastics, you know, there's going to be some somersaults. Like, oh, this person is leading. Ah, I'm going to have to try doing a somersault at some point here, and I, I stink at it, uh, kind of thing. But some are, are follow the leader. Um, I submit to you, there's some life principles that are there. Some life principles that we, we follow leaders in this this world. We have leaders all around us that we follow. Uh, but it also has a discipleship principle too, right? We follow a leader, the leader, Jesus Christ as our leader, the leader of all leaders. The leaders that the leader that leaders are supposed to follow underneath. Alright? So I sent you this passage at the beginning and it's going to start showing in the, the text to come. In Acts, the disciples following their leader, no matter what, and not get caught up in legalistic or licentious responses. We might see a few examples where they do, and they get rebuked for it. But responding with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and sometimes that's not the easy, most of the time it's not the easy way 
to take because it comes with some consequences um, as well. So with that in mind, let's read through this. Starting with verse 12. So the apostles are doing many signs and wonders. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico, which is up on the temple mount. We showed pictures of that before. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. So let's pause there for a second. Why was no one else, you know, kind of, none of the rest dared join them. What's that referring to? Okay, we just had an Ananias. Right, two people just dropped dead in their midst because they were dishonest with their giving. They had lied to the Holy Spirit, and they dropped dead. So fear was in the church, and like, all right, being a disciple of Jesus is a serious thing. We, we need to follow Jesus and take this very seriously. This is what the elder brother tends to get right. There's law and there's things that God wants us to do and to, to be in this, this world. And there's fear and people are not going to jump into this like, man, if I'm not serious about this, I might just end up dead like Ananias and Sapphira. No, thank you. And so they stayed away. Now notice the second half. People held them in high esteem. So they were going about this in a way that was honorable. It was not kind of a, a self-righteous, uh, kind of arrogant coming down over top of, of others. In other words, there's grace that was in here too, and love and caring and, and mercy that was going on that was demonstrable to, to others. This is some of the younger brother stuff coming through that is, is good. Because the church, quite frankly, today is not held in great esteem, and neither are disciples. The way we're held in honor has drifted toward the dishonor side. Now, I get this. I'm, I'm not foolish with this. The media tends to play with this quite a bit. It throws out examples that overemphasize the, the heinousness of the church and of Christians. I get it. There's a lot of good that happens within the church and with that does not get covered because it's not sensational. And I think the church is doing a ton of wonderful stuff and great stuff and disciples in this country that never gets covered and never gets mentioned. This church included. But there's a reputation out there um, of us being arrogant and judgmental and homophobic and all these other kind of, of, of things that we have to know and be aware of in order to be addressed that in a gracious but obedient kind of response from the gospel of, of Jesus Christ. We have an image problem, whether we like it or not, in America. And it has to be dealt with, and it has to be dealt with from a gospel perspective. All right. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. So despite the stuff that's going on, they're, they're still growing. And at this point, Luke has given up count, just multitudes. Remember there was 2,000, 3,000, now it's just like, there's just multitudes. You can't even keep count of them anymore, um, what God is doing through the, the Holy Spirit here. So that even, so they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least a shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. All right, so quite the scene that's happened. Peter's becoming an icon, probably to his chagrin, that they're looking to him as a savior and as a healer and not to Christ, which is why we had that text earlier where Peter explicitly said, don't attribute this to me. This is because of Jesus of Nazareth in his name that you are being healed, not me. All right. There's going to be a group that doesn't like this a whole lot. But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is, the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in public prison. That's a prison that people could see. It was visible to the public. It was making a spectacle of them, saying, hey, if you act like these people, you will end up just like these people in prison. For what you're doing. So they're trying to detour others from following and saying, if you do, you're going to end up here just like, like them. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, 
they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. And when the high priest came, those who were with him, they called together the council, all the senate of the people of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison. So they returned and reported, We found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them and wondering what this would come to. So let's pause there for a second. So another miracle happens by the Holy Spirit, right? God continues to show his presence to the church that he is with them and for them, that not even prison, locked prison with guards. This is bringing up images of the resurrection of Jesus Christ with a stone there, and the stone could not hold him back, and death could not hold him back, and the prison is not going to hold them back either as well. So they got this guarded prison, and these guards, by the way, they were in the... Uh, someone escaped, was punishable by death, could be, depending on who it was that escaped. That if they let someone escape, their life was forfeit. So they took their job very seriously in guarding this. So the Spirit of God gets them right past these guards and tells them to go to the temple court. Now we actually have a modern day example of this. Is anybody familiar with Brother Eden and the Heavenly Man? This book was made popular uh, a while back. Anyone remember this at all? Yeah, this, this guy um, became a Christian in China and was deeply persecuted for his, his faith and thrown into prison multiple times and beat multiple times. Well, the third time he was in prison, they said, we're tired of this guy. And they were, before, were torturing him with electrical shocks and so forth and so on. This time they decided to, to crush his legs with, with sticks and stuff. They just pounded on his legs and just crushed them. Do you not imagine that? In prison, they're just pounding on your legs, and you can't walk, but you'll never walk again. This person's going to stay here for the rest of his life. We're not going to hear a peep out of him again. Well, after his legs were busted up like that, he got prompted by the Holy Spirit, woke him up in the night, and said, Get up, you're going, and you're going to continue to, to preach the word. And he gets up, and he's inside, deep inside, like kind of maximum security of this prison, and he just walks right past guards. All the doors that were locked, unlocked, he walks right through them. And he walks out into the courtyard, and there's guards there, and there's a final gate, and that gate opens, and he walks out, and he gets on the other side. And he looks back, and he realizes he just went through three or four gates and past dozens of people, and not a single one saw him. That's the spirit. That's a miracle that took place. And then he realized, I'm walking. My legs, his legs were miraculously healed. Uh, from that as, as well. So we actually have a, a modern day miracle just, just like that. The Spirit still does miraculous things in and through His, his people and his, his church. All right. So if you're wondering what this is going to come to, Someone came and told them, look, the men in whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. Are you kidding me? Things, things are turning around here. So we, we've got to take a pause here just for a, a moment. They go and they want to get the disciples because they don't like what they're doing because they're, they're back in the temple. They just told them, don't go to the temple and teach in the name of Jesus. or preach in the name of Jesus. So what do they do? The Spirit told them to go do this. Put yourself in their place. What are you going to do? They've just been in prison twice. Peter and John, anyways. The rest of the apostles for the first time. What are you going to do? There's real persecution coming your way if you probably choose yes on, on this. They do exactly what this... They follow their leader, and they go right out to the temple courts and do exactly what the Spirit had told them to do. And so the people come to get them. Now they're afraid of the apostles. They're thinking that they're going to get stoned by all the people around them. What a turn of events here, right? And they ask. This is grace, by the way, where the disciples, they don't have to respond this way. This is a miraculous kind of way they respond, a gospel kind of way. They did not need to go to the council, but they did. They graciously kind of, okay, we will follow, we will go. They were not forced. They chose to go to the council and stand 
in front of them once again. And the same thing, I'm thinking it'll give them another opportunity to preach the gospel to them. We'll see that here in just a few, few moments. So when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in his name, or in this name, they won't even say it. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter, of course, and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. And so that's a re echoing of what they talked about before. That our allegiance is to our leader. Our allegiance is to God, not to you legalistic religious leaders who are getting it wrong. The God of the more, he keeps going, the God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. So here we have Peter and the apostles declaring uh, the good news of Jesus, if you will, who he is as the Messiah, but not just as Messiah, as leader as well. He's our leader. Jesus of Nazareth is our leader through the Holy Spirit. You guys are not our leader. You guys are elder brothers who've got this thing law, um, uh, messed up and caught up in self-righteous law, and you're not seeing the grace and the good news of, of Jesus. This is... Um, Earlier, they talked about uh, the Holy Spirit told them to declare all about the way. And that is simply what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And not its short version of it, the fullness of what that means to be a disciple of Jesus. That we receive him as Savior and Lord, the one that we follow as well. Now again, readers are not happy with this. As... The legalists and the elder brothers are apt to be. They get angry quite easily. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill him. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. This is the person that Lauren was referring to. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care of what you are about to do with these men. For before these days... Thutis rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. Okay, there's the wisdom that, that Warren was, was talking about. Say, look, we've had two examples of something like this before, where a leader rose up and had some followers that took people away from the Jewish faith, and they were killed, just like Jesus of Nazareth, and their disciples just kind of dispersed and came to nothing. Without their leader, they were nothing. There was no other leader to, to be raised up and, and take their, their place and just disperse. He's saying, hey, treat this in the same way. If this is not of God, and Jesus is just another one by Judas the Galilean, his disciples will disperse. This will go away. Not to worry about it. But if this is of God, you will not be able to overcome this. In fact, you'll find yourself opposing God. So take care of how you respond. And they wisely listen. Like, okay, we don't want to go against God. And if this isn't of God, this is going to disperse. I mean, we don't really need to do anything with this. And so they wisely follow Gamaliel's counsel. And they do, well, we'll see what they'll do here in a second. So they took his advice. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charge them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. All right, well, they listened to him, but they weren't going to let him go without a beating. And this is not just a little slap on the wrist. This hurt. This, this is something where they do not want you to forget what they have said. 
This is torture. This is persecution that is happening. Imagine yourself in those shoes. How would you respond? Here's how they responded. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for this man. Wow. See, this is so foreign. At least it is foreign to me. We're so used to our safety and security and privilege, if you will, as disciples of Jesus in America that has taken up a lot of Judeo-American values that has made life really easy for us disciples that we can't even, at least I have a hard time fathoming real persecution like this happening to us. And for their response to be rejoicing, wow, that their posture and their attitude was, we were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. I don't know about you. Maybe like what Lauren talked about. I, there might be some anger coming up. I don't want to kill a few people. And that would be the legalistic brother coming through. And we don't want to brush this all aside as if nothing happened. Like the younger brother, the gospel would say, hey, this is serious stuff, but we are willing to submit to it in the name of Jesus. Because we're about Jesus of Nazareth, not other things. Jesus Christ and preaching reconciliation, the repentance and the forgiveness of sins in and through him. Here's how they continued to respond after that. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. Basically, we're saying, look, Jesus of Nazareth, the one that you crucified, he is the Messiah. He's the one that we've been waiting for as the Jews for a very, very long time. He is God's good news for us. And no, he did not save political Israel and overthrow Caesar, that Jesus hardly even talked about Caesar and Rome, because he was establishing his kingdom, which is not of this world. His kingdom trumps the empires of this world. And that we're to be focused about his kingdom as citizens in his kingdom and not of the empires of this world. And we're to follow that leader. And that leader is the one who put his life down and sacrificed and looked to build others up and not to tear things down in a sense. I don't hear what I said. There's evil in this world that needs to be confronted and that we need to stand up against. There's hard decisions that, ought, that we need to make as disciples today. But Jesus' example is one of submission, low status. And that's the struggle that we find ourselves in. So I invite you to, in closing here, is to pray a simple prayer. How do we do this? It's really practicing the presence of God. To follow the leader well, you need to keep your eye on the leader. And see what they're doing. And act the way they're, they're acting. To take on the character of the leader. You've got to keep your eyes on Jesus. So one of the ways to keep your eyes on Jesus is to remind yourself that we follow Jesus. So, one way to do that is to start the day. First thing you do when you wake up in the morning, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's the Jesus prayer. Simple. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Center yourself on Christ. Remind yourself that you are a disciple of Jesus, not some other title. First and foremost. And then sometime in the middle of the day, maybe lunchtime, somewhere around there, is a good time to do it, is say that prayer again. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. To recenter yourself once again as a disciple of Jesus. And at the end of the day, guess what? Say the same prayer once again, because this is easy. But don't stop there. Let it lead you. Let the Spirit lead you further in to where He wants to lead you. You're you reminded of the Spirit some things you did not do very well today, that I did not do very well, that I did not respond kindly to this person. I acted terribly here. I need to repent and confess and act more like Christ here. And it keeps us centered on Christ, practicing his presence, because we cannot follow the leader if we take our eyes off him or forget him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, sometimes we're not very good at following the leader. Sometimes we get distracted with other things and, and stop following you or at least the biblical version of you, and get caught up in legalistic or licentious versions of you that are not you. So Lord, I pray that we would diligently search your word and seek to be conformed more in the image of your son, Jesus. 
that often flies right in the face of what culture tells us we need to be. That there is humility and selflessness and giving and generosity. Those are some of the acts that we do. And we still hold on to the truths of Scripture. We never let go of the truth of your word that Jesus, you are the truth, but you're also the way and the life. I pray that we'd have a holistic response as disciples of yours today. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.